Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Raheem Thompson. I am the manager of public programs. I, on behalf of our CEO, Susan Abrams, and the entire museum, I would like to thank you all for joining us for this afternoon book and author program on the unanswered letter. We, we have the privilege of having the author, uh, Ferris Cassell, with us here from all the way from Oregon. And she's going to do a PowerPoint presentation to start the program. But afterwards, we will have time for audience Q&A. So please submit all of your questions. Uh, and we will get to as many as we can at the end of the program. I would like to thank all of our community partners who are listed at the start of the program. And once again, I would like to thank you all in attendance. And I hope you have enjoyed the program. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, thank you, Raheem. Uh, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm really glad um, to be able to talk about this book, especially now and a lot of issues that it raises um, uh, seem relevant to our, especially relevant to our, to our world today. So the unanswered letter, One Holocaust Family's Desperate Plea for Help, my book, began with this letter. Um, my husband came home from work last night, one year, one day, and told me that he, uh, that a patient had brought him um, a letter that had been in her, his family, her family for um, 60 years. And um, he, she told him um, that she thought it was a piece of history and maybe uh, he would know better what to do with it than she did. So um, I was uh, making dinner and not sure what was going on. What could this letter be? Why, why would you, this, your patient um, give you something that was a family memento uh, and they'd saved for so long? And he smiled and said, it's just ironic, half a smile, and said, I'm probably the only Jew that she knows. Um, in fact, that was, that was true. Um, so I took the letter and began to read. It starts, I, I saw that it was written, uh, postmarked from Vienna, Germany, in August of 1939. This was after Germany had occupied Austria, after the Anschluss, and um, just a few weeks before World War II would break out in Europe. The letter begins, Dear Madam, you are surely informed about the situation of all Jews in Central Europe, and this letter will not astonish you. He says, by pure chance, I got your address, and as our names are the same, Berger, the last name was Berger. I hope that we may belong to the same family of Moravia. He goes on to say that his daughter, uh, Martha, and her husband, Leo, have an affidavit to go um, to apply for a visa and emigrate to America but they're not able to help him get an affidavit. So he's writing strangers in America, um, begging for help, to, begging for a sponsor, uh, someone who will legally agree to be responsible for an immigrant. This was um, a big ask. This was no small request, but he, he ends his letter um, I beg you once more, help us to follow our children. It is our last and only hope. So reading this letter in my safe, you know, home in my safe life, I was just stunned and very moved. Um, trying to imagine somebody who would be writing halfway across the world to strangers begging for life saving help. Um, the questions in this letter seemed to me just to be flying off the page. Um, I was wondering who, you know, who were these, these um, 
American burghers with the same last name who received the letter. Um, did they ever answer Alfred Berger? Did they uh, offer to help? I wonder, did Alfred and Hedwig and Alfred and his wife Hedwig um, reach America? Did they, um, did, or if they didn't reach America, did they survive? This is the second page of the letter where Alfred writes uh, a little bit of his pers what he calls personal information. He was about uh, 60 when, approximately 60 when he wrote this letter. He was a merchant man, he calls himself, and uh, born in Vienna. His wife Hedwig, born her last name Grunberger, was um, a good 10 years younger, something not uncommon among um, Jewish marriages at that time. Um, and But she was born um, in, um, she had been born in what was then Czechoslovakia, what was then part of the Austrian Empire um, in, in a small town near Prague. Um, you'll notice that they are not citizens of any country, but subjects of Germany. Um, Jews were not citizens in um, 1938, nine, when this letter was written. This is um, the trunk where the, the California burgers saved this letter for so many years. I was curious. I wanted to know what happened. I interviewed the woman who, my husband's patient who had given him the letter and um, tried to find out had this family answered the letter. She hemmed and hawed um, in a way that made me understand that her family had not responded to the letter. Um, so to find out more, I began searching for um, the descendants of Alfred and Hedwig uh, who had supposedly been going to immigrate to America. Had they made it, who were they? I began by uh, contacting the city of Vienna archives, their historic uh, division, uh, who used to have on their website that they kept records from time out of mind. A lovely, a lovely description. They've taken that down and it looks a lot more formal now. Um, the historian there helped me to find records of Alfred and Hedwig on Schmaltz of Gasse um, in, in Vienna, found the name of the daughters uh, who, of Alfred and Hedwig. One daughter, Martha, did in fact immigrate to America. There was a second daughter I discovered um, who had immigrated to Palestine. So I began searching for the descendants of uh, the American daughter and um, uh, found, oh, we, we need you to share the screen for the PowerPoint. Um, okay. So you're not seeing the PowerPoint at all? Not, not yet. Um, just click the green share screen at the bottom. Okay, that's not there at the bottom of my screen. Let me move this up. Okay, let me try another thing. I'm so sorry. There it is. Um, are you? Oh, okay, so I apologize. Um, I'm going to go back a little bit so you can see this letter. And the second page of the letter, thin crinkly airmail paper. This is the beat up old trunk, which in fact had come from Germany um, in the 1800s when this, the Berger family in California had immigrated from Germany. They were not Jewish, however. 
This is um, the Vienna room where um, I did a lot of my research. I discovered the granddaughter of Alfred and Hedwig Berger living in New York. Um, I found her name, Celia Sizes, uh, through the Vienna archives and through social security records of the daughter, Martha, um, in New York. I tried for a month, a full month, to reach Celia. Um, and I never, I didn't get responses. I called her and wrote her letters explaining that I had a letter that I thought was from her grandparent, her grandfather, written in 1939 to strangers in America. Um, and I told them that I was a journalist. I told Celia, uh, and I planned to write us investigate this letter and, and, um, and I was beginning to do that. And I was going to write a story about it. So I kept writing, I kept calling. She never answered until the last day, the 30th day of the month that I had begun to write her. I finally got a, a phone message that said, hello, this is Celia Sizes. I think you've been trying to reach me. And I thought, yes, yes, Celia, I have been trying. So she was highly suspicious of me in the beginning, but we met in New York and um, talked for hours as I shared with her what I had learned about her grandparents, which in fact was a lot more than she had known. Her, her grandparents had um, simply disappeared from the family history. When her parents started to talk about her family, their, her family in Europe, she would begin to cry. And so they learned, she had learned not to talk more about it. Um, I, through Celia, I also came into, uh, to, into connection with um, the, the descendants of, of Alfred and Hedwig's second daughter in Israel. And uh, and descendants of um, Alfred's brother Herman, who had escaped to America shortly after the Anschluss. He had family in America. He had his wife um, owned an import business in New York, the Guth family, and they uh, were able to sponsor Herman Berger and his family early in the after the Anschluss before it was uh, before the Nazis prevented Jews from taking anything but a couple a few uh, Reichmark out of out of Austria. So he had been able to come with his entire household of furniture, which um, his his uh, grandson Herman's grandson, um, Peter, uh had then and who created a whole room on his house he called the vienna room uh to store not only the furniture but boxes and boxes of family letters uh burger family letters from uh as far back as the 1800s celia had found letters in her closet too and um so I was, I was all of a sudden beginning to find not only from, um, from, you know, Austrian archived information, but from the actual voices of the family, the Berger family itself. At, in the Vienna room, I saw the first picture that I would encounter of Alfred Berger. And here he is in the back row with the glasses on. His brother Herman, whose grandson had the Vienna room, is in the front. Um, Alfred's brother Richard and um, his sister uh, Matilda and his brother Arnold, all in this picture. Here, here are Alfred and his wife Hedwig in an enge engagement picture. When Alfred's um, probably about in his early 30s, Hedwig younger. 
you'll notice that um, Alfred's glasses are thicker here. He had macular degeneration and his eyes sight was declining. But this picture I think is just lovely. I love this picture. They both seem um, like such a beautiful young couple. Alfred's uh, flaring, flaring um, handlebar mustache was just the height of fashion at the time. And um, Hedwig wore her hair for this picture in a style that would be um, very stylish today. Here's the family a few years later with their two daughters, Martha on the left and the younger one, Gretel, on the right. They're walking here. This is a picture in the Vienna woods where before the Auschwitz, before the Nazis came to Austria, um, Jewish families, like all other Viennese families, love to spend a weekend um, afternoon walking. When I first saw this letter, I had envisioned Alfred and Hedwig as alone, um, as he mentions in his letter. But um, in fact, in Vienna, they had a big, thriving, extended family um, who, were, who were very close and saw each other frequently. Here's a picture of them on um, the steps of uh, Richard um, and Olga's home. Richard was had become very affluent and um, owned a textile mill. Um, Richard is, if you remember the previous picture, is the youngest brother of Alfred, and Hedwig is the sister, of, and Olga is the sister of um, Hedwig. So a brother uh, and a sister uh, married each other. So these these children are closer than first cousins. Uh, genetically, they're, they're uh, halfway between siblings and cousins. Um, here is, um, let's see, here's Martha. And here is Gretel. Gretel and uh, her first cousin, um, Ernst, are standing in the front row, the only ones with hats and coats, their arms flung around each other. It's a wonderful picture of these two who will, do look like they're ready for adventure. And in fact, they will have an adventure together, um, not of their choosing. So here is, um, a picture of Martha's husband, Leo, who was an artist as well as a tailor and jack of all trades in their apartment. You'll see uh, he's a wonderful painter. You'll see behind me a picture of painting, oil painting that in fact um, Leo did uh, and Celia, uh, Leo's uh, granddaughter, um, Leo's daughter would um, later give to me. This is Martha's grand piano. She was a concert level pianist. Here's Martha in their kitchen. And here's Gretel, then a teen, young teenager. This rather innocuous piece of uh, do this document is actually holds a very dramatic story. This is the record of Ernst Berger um, Alfred's nephew, uh, his military record in the Austrian army. All Jews uh, were doing whatever they could to protect Austria as Germans massed on the border between Austria and Germany, threatening to invade. Um, Ernst joined the infantry and became a sniper. He was sent to the border uh, to defend against Hitler when the Austrian president surrendered without a shot being fired. Um, Alfred's, I mean, Ernst's unit was withdrawn to Vienna. Instead of uh, to protect against Austria against Hitler, his mission and the Austrian army's mission was to defend Hitler. Ernst was stationed in 
a building um, overlooking Hitler's parade, triumphant parade route into Vienna, supposedly to uh, protect against any possible uh, threats from the crowd below. So he was in the, had his gun sights on Hitler as Hitler passed before the window. As Hitler did pass, the Austrian army uh, officers who were in the room with um, Ernst left the room and leaving this young Jew alone, his gun pointed at Hitler. Ernst later told his family that he was um, tempted. He, oh, he had his finger on the trigger and almost um, pulled that trigger and then naively thought that it, if, a, if a Jew was discovered to have assassinated the Fuhrer, um, all hell would break out um, and Jews would suffer terrible uh, reprisals not understanding, not having any way to understand, as no one in the world yet did, uh, what, what was in store for the Jews. This is the last picture we have of Alfred and Hedwig and their Gretel, Martha, and Leo in Vienna. You can see many differences in the family um, from the earlier pictures when, they're, when they look happy and, and eager for life. They look grim and in their, their expressions of uh, rigid and forced. You'll notice Alfred's glasses have gotten very thick here. He's the only one in this picture not looking at the camera. That's because of his macular degeneration. By this time, Alfred was legally blind and, and carried a white cane. Martha and Gretel would part the next day after this, this, uh, that picture was taken. Gretel was um, active in a young Zionist group in Vienna, the Betar, and um, had managed to get a, a place on the second, the second ship of escaping young, young Zionists uh, who left Vienna on a ship, on a chartered ship down to the Mediterranean, down the Danube to the Mediterranean, and then across the Mediterranean to, um, to Palestine. The journey was um, approved by, um, by um, Eichmann himself, who stood on the platform to make sure there were no uh, scenes of uh, protest against the Nazis as these young Zionists left. The ship made its way under um, fire at times from the British airplanes overhead who did not want a flood of young Jews, um, young Jewish immigrants entering Palestine which was then a Brit the British mandate of Palestine and Arabs were in um, up up in revolt against um, not only the mandate, but all these uh, this influx of, of refugees, Jewish refugees. But um, the Greek pirate ship that the uh, young Zionist group was able to charter taking taking Gretel to Palestine did make it across the sea, dumped the Jewish refugees into the water um, off the shore. They had to swim to shore. Their backpacks, pulling their backpacks, their shoes tied, yeah, their shoelaces tied and, and shoes flung around their necks. But they did swim to shore, all of them safely, and um, made it to Palestine. Martha would leave um, a year later two years later, uh, she did get an affidavit um, and a visa and eventually a visa that would allow her to go to uh, to immigrate to New York. This is um, a composite picture uh, with Leo in the center. Leo was an illegal Polish immigrant in um, in Palestine in in Vienna. And as such, he was just 
one of the prime targets for Hitler's rage against the Jews. Um, Martha and Leo uh, were rounded up once and um, taken uh, on a train to uh, to the Polish border. Um, this is the famous incident um, where uh, the, one of the families on that train that, that Martha and Leo were on, um, a, a relative of one of the other, one of the people on that train was the young man who broke into um, the German embassy in Paris and shot and killed a, a a, a German officer. Uh, this event triggering Kristallnacht across Europe. Um, Martha and Leo had escaped from that train. They, when the doors opened at a station on its way to Poland, they simply ran out of the train, ran through the station, and caught another train back to Vienna. Reaching there, reaching Vienna. Um, as the city was in flames at Kristallnacht. Um, they knew that Leo had to get out of, of Vienna soon and bought an illegal uh, visa to enter, enter um, Cuba, an illegal uh, paper allowing him to enter uh, Cuba. Here he is in the Havana Harbor awaiting entry into the country. So he could sit there and wait for his own visa, uh, which was a legal visa, um, but his quota number had not risen to the top. He needed a safe place to, uh, to wait for his visa to um, be called. The ship in the background here is the famous SS St. Louis, which like Leo's ship, was turned away from the port. The uh, Cuban president was demanding huge bribes, even larger bribes than the Jews had already paid for their ships to be admitted to Havana. When the Jews could not pay the bribes, bribes these ships were turned back. The SS St. Louis was had to return to the port where, from which it departed, which was Hamburg. Germany. So although the SS St. Louis tried to find um, a safe port up and down the American coast and in South America, it was forced to return to Hamburg, where a number of these passengers uh, were sent to death camps. Leo fortunately had departed from France and his ship uh, returned there. In France, he was interned by the French army. Um, and then uh, with the French army, he was taken close to, he was marched north to Dunkirk, um, where the, his unit was going to support the um, retreating, retreating British. Uh, the, the, the Germans uh, invaded further, further into the country before uh, Leo's unit could reach reach the British, and so his unit ran literally ran from the north of France to the south, and Leo ran with them. He ended up in Marseille, um, and needed to hide there from from um, the um, it was called the uh, Vichy occupied zone. It wasn't directly. Um, as directly under control, German control, but essentially a vicious anti-Semitic regime. So Leo hid in the Pyrenees, uh, the last little town at the end, end of a rail line in the Pyrenees. He had thought he might cross the border into Spain, but that border was slammed shut just as he tried to cross. And so he waited, waited in this little town in the Pyrenees for two years, trying to get his papers approved in um, America. As probably many people know already, um, at that time, the State Department was 
was controlled by an anti-Semitic and anti-refugee group of officials who would not approve um, visas and not approve the quota number, not um, permit the, the quota numbers to move forward. Um, and so Leo was stuck until finally in July, in June of um, 1941, the consul in Marseille, whose name was Hiram Bingham, and you can see his, oops, see his signature on the bottom of this page. Hiram Bingham was um, later called, uh, designated righteous among Jews for being the only consul who would approve these, um, these Jews affidavits. He, uh, when it was discovered in the State Department what he was doing, um, he was sent, uh, he was taken, a, he was transferred from his post in, in Europe to a backwater post in South America. His career essentially ended. But on the last day before he was um, fired, basically, um, he signed um, Leo's visa. This is Martha waiting on the docks of New at New York Harbor. She had arrived um, fairly promptly in um, November of 1939 as World War II was raging and um, managed to get uh, with great difficulty onto the SS Washington, a ship um, uh, run by the United States out of New York. So she, she, was, she was safe in New York, waiting, waiting for Leo to arrive. Um, letter, mail between Europe and, and America was very much in her, um, intercepted and, and censored. And so letters from, from France were difficult and, and came sometimes several months after they were written. Martha would go down to the to the docks and wait um, as ships came in and um, hope that Leo was on this one or that one. Um, here she is waiting and you can see the ship is already emptied. Um, Leo was not on this ship. Eventually, of course, he did he did arrive and um, the <clears throat> Martha and Leo were um, reunited. This is a copy of, these are, are some of the letters um, that Alfred and Hedwig wrote to Martha and Leo from Vienna, begging for an affidavit, telling them how they were, and um, trying not to upset, duly upset um, their daughter and son-in-law, um, maintaining such a level of courage and resolve um, that that I was was very moved and inspired by by Alfred and Hedwig's um, just strength and in the love that they had for their family um, and the love that their family had for them. Um, we don't, of course, have any of the letters that Martha and Leo wrote back to Vienna. Those were destroyed, of course, as um, Alfred and Hedwig both both perished um, in the Holocaust. They were slated, both of them were slated, Alfred and Hedwig, for deportation to Russia um, in um, 1942. Um, they'd been moved from apartment to apartment and um, to smaller and smaller places into a ghetto area of Vienna. And, um, but kept writing, kept writing, as long as they were able to. You can see um, how Alfred's le uh, handwriting um, has disintegrated as he went progressively blind. This is practically illegible. This here uh, on this side is a letter that Alfred wrote to his brother Herman in New York. Um, in writing to his brother, he was able to speak more freely than he spoke to his daughter, um, not wanting to upset her. 
he told in this letter he reveals that Hedwig he's glad to welcome Hedwig back from Nordhausen. Hedwig had been um, had been in, put into forced labor um, and sent to Nordhausen. Um, so fortunately, Alfred was able to petition her out because of his blindness, and he would um, need the help of his wife to manage his life. It is a very strange anomaly. It is so weird and so typical of Nazi, um, the, the bizarre policies of the Nazis, um, that the Nazis allowed Jews to petition uh, somebody uh, who, was, who was disabled and needed help to petition them home. So Hedwig, was returned to to Vienna um, shortly before that camp Nordhausen became um, basically a death camp the the work was so arduous these are the last pictures that uh, we have of Alfred and Hedwig um, this is a painting done by Leo probably taken from that photograph that of them around the table You'll see how his eyes have become, um, it's not only the blindness, but, but the grief and the weariness that, that they seem to hold. This one of Hedwig uh, from her earlier days, I think retains her, her kind of um, Madonna-like um, expression of, of sort of peace and calm. This is a picture of myself on the right, my husband Sidney and Celia Sizes in Vienna in front of the um, Burgers um, apartment building on Schmalzofgasse. We traveled there um, together to learn more about the letter. We went to archives and travel and visited the different apartments where Alfred and Hedwig had been imprisoned. This is a picture of the grandchildren of Alfred and Hedwig, um, who um, were from Israel. Um, the, the daughters of Gretel Berger, who escaped to Palestine, Mika and Judith Berger, and again Celia, posing in the same place that their mothers had posed as they left Vienna. I especially loved love this picture because it had been Alfred and it had been Hitler's uh, goal, his whole mission, his comp, to eliminate, eradicate, exterminate all Jews from Europe, all the Jews. He envisioned a small museum in, in um, Prague, which would be a little ethnic museum showing about this group who once lived in a few areas of Europe. Here they are, the Jews of um, who who returned and in a Jewish community now thriving in Vienna. I like to end with this picture um, because it's so moving. These two children here um, were children of friends of Alfred and Hedwig who did manage to escape to America. The rest of these children who lived in the apartment that Alfred and Hedwig lived in, none of them did escape. So I, I just think it's the most moving and um, disturbing picture. Um, so I end this talk feeling that I answered um, a lot of the questions that I started with. Um, what happened to Alfred and Hedwig during the Holocaust? But I found that I ended with, with new questions um, that were much more difficult and possibly unanswerable, but still r raised by this story of uh, two Jews. Um, who died in the Holocaust to ordinary Jews. What would I do if I had received Alfred and Hedwig's letter? What would I do if I were um, 
Would I help somebody to immigrate? What would I do if I were an Aryan trapped in, in Nazi land during the Holocaust? Would I have tried to help Jews? What would I have done if I had been um, a Jewish, a, a Jew in Vienna in those times? How, how would I have tried to escape? Would I have been able to escape? And a question that the letter itself leaves for, for us today, I think for everyone today. Um, the burghers who received this letter, in fact, could have saved these lives. And I think the letter then speaks to the power that we all have um, to make a difference in the world, to change the world. And so I, I find that the letter uh, to me is an inspiring, a, a, a tragic and also inspiring letter that, that really reverberates um, in our lives today. So I um, welcome any questions and, and any discussion that you um, may want to have. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Ferris. Um, thank you for your presentation and thank you for sharing your story with us. And we're gonna get started with the audience Q&A. And the first question we have is, why didn't Herman or his U.S. sponsors not help Alfred and his wife? That's, that's a deep and disturbing question. Um, Celia and her mother, Martha, um, couldn't really um, add, they, they, they loved their, they loved Herman, uh, but they always had um, an anger in their hearts about that. Herman's wife uh, was um, also had family trapped in Europe. And so this is one of the, the, the horrible things um, that happened to Jews who escaped is they had to choose who they would help. And um, Herman saved, Herman and his wife did save a number of that family, his wife's family. Um, he, belatedly Herman belatedly tried to help his sister but by the time that he was sending her letters um, and offering to help she had already been she was one of the early Jews um, to have been deported to Riga where she was shot and killed um, he I think Herman felt that because of Alfred's blindness that he would not have been admitted um, anyway to America. But that is not written anywhere. And um, so there are a lot of uh, conjectures in that family, in the Berger family, about what happened. Um, but no one really knows, sadly. All right. Um, the next question starts off with a little bit of a comment. I'm going to read it all the way through. Um, of the many Holocaust books I've read, yours is one of the most relatable. That is, 80 years hence, we can relate to the everyday life, if not the disruptions, of the burghers and their friends and neighbors in the 1940s, as well as to the emotional trauma of their descendants as you research the family's history with their help in recent years. Why did you choose this perspective, not dwelling unduly on the horrific to tell this story and what Holocaust books have you read beforehand that inspired you? Oh my, a lot of questions in there. Yeah. Uh, so um, I, when I held this letter, I felt that I was holding a life in my hands. Really, I, I really felt a connection to that letter and I when I started to um, to do the research, I didn't have a, a clear plan in mind. I actually thought I would write a, just a newspaper article about the letter being stored and you know just a sort of an interesting art of historical artifact. Um, but as I started to, um, the more I learned, the more connected I became to this to this um, family, tra this trapped family. And um, 
in my research as I pushed a little more, I called a reporter um, at the New York Times who had written a story about his family. Um, and I was actually wanting to just um, find out a little bit about what sources he used, what resources there were to, to start the research. And he, he thought, he mistakenly thought that I was wanting to have uh, the Times write a story about this letter. And so he asked me, um, were they important? Uh, were these important people? And, um, you know, I was taken aback by the question. He meant, were they famous? And I took it in a whole different way. Um, I took it, were they important people? Were they important human beings in this world? And, um, but taken aback and taken by surprise, I said, no, they weren't important. I answered what he intended. So he said, thank you and goodbye, basically. Um, but I was moved by the question and by the thought that here I held um, a record, perhaps the only record, of his effort to survive um, this evil, evil force in the world. And I wanted to find out what was his experience, what did they live through. I wanted to write a book in which people could identify with this person's experience and know what it meant to live under um, the terror of um, a totalitarian an evil uh, um, territorial uh, uh, despotic um, rule. And so I, I wanted to find out everything I possibly could about who these people were and what they experienced so that people reading it could identify and um, understand themselves what it would be like to go through this experience. Great. Um, did you have contact with the burgers in California? Yes. Um, by the time that I had written, that I had started um, the research, the burgers in California um, had passed away. Um, through through the through my husband's patient, uh, who had given him the letter, I was able to trace descendants of them in um, in who lived in Canada. They had been immigrants themselves in Canada, which was the the um, the the wife of the person of the family who received the letter in California. The wife had been Canadian and she had immigrated herself. Uh, so they knew all about affidavits. Um, but I did talk to the Canadian family who had heard nothing at all about the letter. They knew nothing about it. And so every avenue I um, explored trying to find out anyone who knew um, these burgers um, in California, um, no one had heard about the letter. Um, and so from that I deduced, I could not prove, but I deduced that um, while, they hit, while the, the Clarence and B. Burger in California, in Los Angeles had saved the letter for, for over half a century, they did not answer it. Why did they save it? We don't know. We can only guess, was it guilt? Was it just an interest in history? I don't, we, we will never know. All right. Um, how long did your research take from the time you first saw the letter until you started writing your book? Um, I received the letter in the year 2000. I was busy at the time, my life was really busy. Um, I had three children and um, a job and a husband with a, with a very full, full uh, practice. So I put the letter aside, my husband and I both put the letter aside, saved it, thought about it, occasionally took it out and read it, but I didn't, um, didn't begin writing or researching the book till 2004. 
that's when um, I decided I I had left my my work at, at the newspaper and was really searching for something else to write about. I wanted to write something, you know, longer and more in depth than newspapers allowed. And um, something that was worth my time um, to write about. And then I, you know, I thought about the letter and I thought, well, there it is sitting, sitting right in front of me and waiting. Um, so it was just sort of the, the coming together of a lot of events in my life that, that made me start in 2004. Um, and life intervened between during the time that I had started the research and by the time I ended. Um, so it took me quite a long while. This book was published in uh, 2020. 20, um, yeah, I think it came out in hardback in, in uh, fall of 2020. And um, but in the intervening time, um, between the time I went to to um, Vienna with with the Berger descendants, and the time that I be, that I actually finished the manuscript, um, new information kept popping up. Um, Celia did not discover the letters, all that wealth of letters in her closet, in a suitcase in the in in the top shelf of back of a closet. She did not remember that she had the suitcase of letters until I was already in the process of writing um, this story. And I was writing it with some misgivings because I felt that the that I didn't really know who these people were, and I didn't know enough from just the history books uh, about their experience. So um, here I have a, a hundred letters written in this old um, old uh, script that n no one that people in the German department at the University of Oregon. I took some of these letters that Celia, you know, loaned to me um, to, some, to some people in the de history department and they um, didn't have the time at that, at that time to, or, or maybe interest to, to help me translate them. So eventually I found um, a Holocaust survivor who lived, you know, not a, <clears throat> hardly a couple miles from my house, um, a lovely woman um in her early 80s who had survived Theresienstadt. Uh, she had spent four years as a teenager in Theresienstadt. Um, she, I went to interview her about the Holocaust and um, just to to continue with my research and learn more um, about the Holocaust and she, as I was leaving I I just, happened to say, oh, I, I don't suppose you might be interested in helping me to translate a few of these letters. And without um, without a second passing, she said, sure, I would love to do that. Um, I offered to pay Hilda Geisen was her name. Her her name in Germany had been Geisenheimer. Um, I offered to pay her, but she wouldn't accept it. She just said this would be interesting. So I went to her house um, every week um, for over a year. Um, she, she took some trips, this and that, um, but I went to her house regularly um, with my laptop and she sat on, on, you know, in her rocking chair and sight read the letters slowly and painfully. They were very difficult. For her to even to make out the letters um, written, uh, you know, so many years ago on this um, in the airmail mail paper, to save to save paper, which Alfred and Hedwig did not have a great great stash of, they would write up the sides of <laughs> of these letters down the other side. They would write on the back, and the and the ink would bleed through. So they, this was a painful process, um, which took really several years to finish. So information came slowly and um, and I'm frankly, honestly, I learned how to write a, a full length book 
slowly. Um, the, the, the pieces of paper, the, the drafts that I've thrown on my floor, <laughs> discussed, um, you know, would create a giant pile. Um, this, I wrote many drafts of this book before I felt that it, it fully told the story adequately. Why, why didn't Hedwig and Alfred try to go to Palestine? They did. did the groups only allow young people? Yes, absolutely. That was their, they felt their mandate is to get the young people uh, who could start a new country. So you had to have, if you were older, and especially Alfred was, was blind. Um, this he was just not um, going to be on the Zionists list of people to go to Palestine. Um, Alfred's brother, um, Arnold, um, his, <clears throat> his son, Ernst, did make it with Gretel to Palestine. Ernst became um, a member of the underground there and a member of the police, the, first the British police, and then, and then uh, joined, um, you know, the Palestine Jewish police. Um, he was able to get, through his influence, he was able to get Ernst to Palestine, but um, because of his age, his, his uh, health, his and Hendrik's health, they, um, nobody, nobody would take them. Not, not in Palestine and not in America and not in any country around the world. They, they tried South America. They tried everything they could. The next question. Um, do, did you have to read or speak German um, in, in, in your research? Um, it would have been very helpful um, to read things in German. So no, I don't speak or read German. Um, I had to rely on a number of people helping me along the way. So this book really, um, you know, there's a list of acknowledgments in the back where I thank so many people um, who helped me, including um, when I first got this letter, I um, wasn't, uh, didn't at all feel capable of, of writing anything about the Holocaust. By chance, a friend, um, a friend of ours knew um, one of the founders of the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., Michael Berenbaum. And as a favor to this friend, um, Michael Berenbaum saw this letter, said he understood my position um, as, an, as an outsider um, to the whole world of the Holocaust. And said that he would read this book for errors, um, for, for factual um, accuracy um, when the manuscript was, was finished. So 10 years after he made this, this generous offer, I wrote him an email and said, you, you won't remember me and I'm just writing on the chance that you might still um, be willing to look at this manuscript and um, before I, you know, within an hour, he had written back and said, sure, glad to do it. So this, this letter um, went through many hands and in, in many, um, many people's support um, to be able to tell the story. I, I will say that, that the manuscript that, that um, Dr. Berenbaum read was, was in good shape and I think that he made some additions. He told me the exact number, he knew it on the just off the top of his head of of what was destroyed in, in uh Kristallnacht. He knew every number of the prayer houses and the in the synagogues and in the numbers who killed and, and deported. So but um and he made me distinguish, which most people do not do, between the term Nazi and the and the in German, those two terms. They're not synonymous. Um, one is a country and a people, and one is people. One refers to people who were actual 
members of the Nazi party. So I had made that error um, in the book. And um, he, he gave me several statistics to help, but the, the manuscript um, had been in, in good shape and I, but I was, I remain extraordinarily grateful to him for his efforts. Thank you. Um, we're out of time, but we have 19 unanswered questions and <laughs> I'm, sure I'm, glad, will... I'm glad to answer anybody's questions as long as anybody would like to stay. But if, if time is, is up, then, then, uh, you know, that's fine too. Yes. Um, do you have, a, um, an email or something you want to share that they can reach you maybe and get their questions answered or what, what is your preferred method of contact? Um, sure. Email is, is great. I don't do much on social media, so email is the best way. And I think you have my email. You could share it with those 19 people. Yes. The one that you asked me to put is my LinkedIn email. So I'm, I'm very busy uh, working on another Holocaust book right now um and working hard with with in fact a, a short deadline ahead so if i'm not very prompt with with an answer um just just believe that i will get to it all right so i uh dropped uh ferris's email in the chat but before you all go i would like to thank you again for joining us for on this afternoon's program ferris thank you as well for your time I look forward to seeing you this summer for the U.S. Track and Field World Championships wow. Award. Um, and I hope to see everyone else in the next program. And do you have any closing remarks, um, Ferris? No, I don't. Just, just my gratitude that for your work there in, in Illinois um, and for having me on your, on your program. All right. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day. Many Thanks thanks.